currently about the issues facing society. David is currently the counselor to the president at Oberlin College, and he's probably best known for his pioneering work on environmental literacy in higher education and his work in ecological design. He raised funds for and spearheaded the effort to design and build a 7.2 million environmental studies center at Oberlin. And it's a building that was described by the New York Times as the most remarkable of a new generation of college buildings, and it was selected as one of 30 milestone buildings in the 20th century by the U.S. Department of Energy. David's also the author of eight books and more than 220 articles, reviews, book chapters, and other professional publications. His newest book is Dangerous Years, Climate Change, The Long Emergency, and The Way Forward, which will be published by Yale University Press this summer. In the past 25 years, David has served as a board member or advisor to many, many foundations and other organizations, including the Rocky Mountain Institute and the Aldo Leopold Foundation, and he's currently a trustee of the Bioneers, the Alliance for Sustainable Colorado, and the World Watch Institute. He's received dozens of awards, including a Lynn Hurst Prize and the National Wildlife Federation National Achievement Awards, um, which very prestigious awards from, from across the country. He's also been awarded eight honorary degrees and has lecture, lectured at hundreds of colleges and universities throughout the world. He's also the founder and chair of the board at the Oberlin Project and a founding editor of the journal Solutions. So I could go on and on, but I actually want you to hear from him. And so we're so lucky to have David with us today and let's give him a big virtual welcome. And David, I hope you're on and ready to go. Here I am, thanks for that. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you sound perfect. Good, good, okay. Um, well, Judy, thanks. It's a great honor to be here, and thanks to all of you for joining for afternoon conversation about uh, systems. And the structure of the talk is roughly as follows. I'm going to discuss a bit about systems and uh, systems thinking. I'm going to present three cases to you. I want to talk about the importance of these, and then I want to come to some conclusions. I'm going to suggest a little bit of reading afterwards, um, but I want to begin with um, Danella Meadows, who was one of the, one of the life part times. She died, unfortunately, way too early, but she wrote a book called Thinking in Systems, which you'll see at the very end of the talk as one of the recommended readings. And I want to begin with a couple of comments uh, from her book. First of all, she writes, self-organizing, nonlinear feedback systems are inherently unpredictable. They are not controllable. They are understandable only in the most general way. The goal of foreseeing the future exactly and preparing for it perfectly is unrealizable. And so that tempers expectations that this is a, a magical method. Then she goes on, we can't control systems or figure them out, but we can dance with them. I already knew that in a way. I learned about dancing with great powers from whitewater kayaking, from gardening and playing music, from skiing, all those endeavors that require one to stay wide awake. Pay close attention, participate flat out, and respond to feedback. And then finally, um, one other quote from her book, Thinking in Systems. Don't be an unthinking intervener and destroy the system's own self-maintenance capacity. Before you charge in to make things better, pay attention to the value of what's already there. That leads me to the New York Times today, the story in the science section of the New York Times, taken from an article that the great science, uh, climate scientist Jim Hansen has just published in a European journal. And the article <clears throat> that accompanied the New York Times piece written by Jim Hansen was this. We've uncovered information and a partial understanding of feedbacks in the climate system, specifically interactions between the ocean and the ice sheets. These feedbacks raise questions about how soon we will pass points of no return in which we lock in consequences that cannot be reversed in any time scale that people care about. Consequences include sea level rise of several meters, which we estimate would occur this century or at latest next century. A more immediate threat is the likelihood of shutting down the oceans, overturning circulations in the North Atlantic 
and Southern Ocean. The consequences mean a loss of all coastal cities, most of the world's large cities, and their history. So that is background. Thinking in systems matters. Uh, Judy, I need to see the screen. Judy, okay. is it still there? Yes. I got the uh, welcome slide up. And can you you can switch it now if you go to the top there, David? Is you know where you were? There you go. I've got. Okay, there there we go. So that that is the the title page. What's the system? Why does it matter? And from Hanson's quote, and from Danella Meadows, who was one of the great system thinkers of uh, the past uh, century, you see that it really does matter. So what is a system? How do we think about systems? And one observation, in reading a law book, uh, this summer by Lawrence Tribe, the Harvard uh, Constitutional Law Scholar, he describes in the quote on the screen that when you change something in a system, it changes everything. William Faulkner in Absalom, Absalom says much of the same things, but once you've altered any variable in a system, it's a different kind of system. So what is a system? Kenneth Boulding, the great economist, uh, Scottish economist, and uh, once president of the American Economic Association, says anything that is not chaos, if there is any pattern or structure, then that you're dealing with a system. Danella Meadows put it uh, this way in the same book that I quoted from, the system is an interconnected set of elements that is coherently organized in a way that achieves something. It consists of elements, interconnections, and a purpose or function. Robert Jervis, a political scientist, goes on and talks about the same thing, interconnected elements. Garrett Hardin described it, the, the great biologist described it as being ideas in modern science, one of the most important, but almost impossible to define. So systems are inherently vague. For this particular culture, I think it is probably the most subversive concept because it describes us as being irrevocably interrelated. We are no one is an island unto themselves, as John Dunn uh, once put it, and no thing is an island. We live in this constant flow of materiality uh, and energy and so forth, and so there's no escaping this. That's hard for people in the Western culture, maybe particularly in the United States, because the awareness, the awareness of systems undermines the idea that we're individuals and unique and uh, we stand on our own and the idea of a self-made person or self-made man. Systems work in various kinds of ways. So you should see on the screen some of the terms used in systems theory, stocks and flows. Uh, so when Jim Hansen's talking about one of the variables in climate change as being ice and so forth, that is a stock. The flow is melt water into the North Atlantic or into the Southern Pacific or Southern Atlantic. The leads and lags refer to the lag time between a change in the system and the actual appearance of the change or the effect, and the same with lags. Feedback is, is simply the change of the system in response to a initiated change. So a thermostat has been one of the classic uh, models of a uh, feedback mechanism. You turn the thermostat up and then the system responds accordingly. Emergent properties are simply a way to say that as systems change, different things emerge. And so water uh, was once said to be two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen, but there's a third thing that makes it water and no one knows what that is. That is the emergent property. Resilience of systems related again to sustainability, but the graphic, what I've tried to show in this slide is that systems, all systems exist in this uh, transition between chaos and harmony. There's no such thing as something that simply stays put uh, forever. And then I want to uh, divert in this slide just a little bit into some of the thinking about the way systems evolve. And systems are always embedded in other systems. Think of your own body. There are cells and uh, molecules and then organs and then systems of organs, and then there's all of a sudden you. And so what this article is one of the classic uh, 
Articles and Systems Theory by J.K. Feigelman in 1954. He actually has 10 different levels, but I put this in here to indicate that systems are always embedded in other systems and affected by both those lower and those that are higher. Again, the body is one of the best uh, examples of this. To make a transition, I want to leave this as kind of a brief introduction to systems language and, and why this is important. But this, and this is a, a quote taken from Carl Heinrich Robert, um, one of the, he was an oncologist by profession, the founder of the Natural Step in Sweden and then also extended uh, to the United States. He writes here, systemic errors of societal design. They'll make things worse and worse until the systemic errors are addressed. The very conditions for survival and prosperity will continue to systematically decline. The problem is that industrial society is designed so that pollutants are bound to increase in concentrations globally. So what we have, and I'll come to this, back to this point at the very end, the behavior of systems creates certain kinds of phenomena and uh, conditions that are never accidental. And so if we want to understand why things occur, we have to understand the rules of the particular system, what is incentivized and what is, what is not. The first of three examples is food and agriculture. And I once gave students in a class a very simple question. I said, explain to me the dead zone off the mouth of the Mississippi River. It's roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. It grows, uh, it has grown recently, particularly since the uh, BP blowout. But explain that to me and come up to the board and draw what you think is the system that produced that particular phenomenon. And they did. And about 45 minutes later, the front chalkboard was covered with all kinds of things. It ranged from nitrogen fertilizer, various kinds of farm policy issues, banking issues, farming issues, and uh, the food system. So when you begin to think about what were the rules of the system, the students pointed out that there was an issue, the very starting point for that system was wrong, and it was symbolized or is symbolized in this advertisement from Archer Daniel Midlands. And the assumption written in this advertisement that was taken out of an Atlantic Monthly magazine, you blow that center circle up, the statement, what if we looked at the world as one giant farm field? So they created a system based on that particular assumption. And then this is what that looks like. And I've taken out the animation just to speed up the, the flow here. But my part of the world, the, the upper Midwest, has become a giant protein factory. That protein in the form of corn and soybeans is shipped out to animal gulags, uh, denoted by a couple of arrows there. Uh, confinement feeding operations. Uh, the uh, slaughterhouse is a little bit further west, confinement feeding operations. That depends a good bit on the Ogallala aquifer and migrant labor and so forth and so on. You, you begin to see a pattern here. You've taken basically a continental-sized country and rendered it into a giant protein and food factory and the dead zone down at the bottom of the screen off the uh, mouth of the Mississippi is one of the results, but it is only one of the results of that system. If you take that system apart, and uh, this is a complicated diagram, uh, it uh, explains in different ways the components of that system. It goes to stock prices, banking practices, federal policy, giant food companies, different actors of all sorts, and uh, I don't want to dwell on that slide, but that is a pretty good indication of the way the system is structured. And it raises then an issue of one of the uh, properties of the system, of course, is that we don't pay the cost of the food. The real cost of our cheap food policy is listed in this slide, which goes down a long, and you could make a much longer list, but uh, it eventually affects uh, human health and biodiversity and so forth, but the food, the prices that we pay in the United States for food, roughly 14% of take-home uh, income in the country compared to 23 to 25% in Europe, uh, doesn't reflect the full cost of 
what we actually have done, the full cost of operating that particular system. And then uh, one of the costs is the drawdown of the Ogallala Aquifer, and if your history uh, recollection is good, the Dust Bowl years of, that started in the 1930s uh, were never really overcome. What we did was to tap into fossil water in the form of the Ogallala Aquifer, which has roughly or had at one time roughly the volume of Lake Huron in the Great Lakes uh, underground that had been stored there for thousands and thousands of years. So given the system failure, it's operating in a way that can't be sustained in the Midwest, the breadbasket of the United States. Uh, we've had to tap into fossil reserves, and that, of course, is not the only thing that we've done. This is a picture of uh, one of the, the great thinkers and activists in, in American uh, agriculture and one of the founders of the movement called Sustainable Agriculture. This is West Jackson, and this is an unplowed prairie uh, in southern Kansas, uh, south of Salina. And what Wes has done is to look at the way prairies actually farm. He's taken the system as it evolved in nature and asked how can we mimic that particular system that sponsored its own fertility, didn't require pesticides, herbicides, or anything else. It just existed with plants and animals and soil microbes. It existed as a polyculture with roots that would go down uh, into the prairie soil 20, 25 feet. And so it was impervious to uh, drought for the most part, uh, grazed by uh, buffalo and so forth, and that system existed in pretty uh, close harmony uh, until farmers came into it. And Jackson has looked at the bottom of this quote, saying if we, if we look at natural systems like this as models or human systems. Such research would require us, he says, to study whole systems that would violate the Cartesian view that places priority on parts over the whole. So what does it mean to study whole systems? It's more than simply interdisciplinary uh, education. Uh, I want to stop at this point and just ask if there are any uh, questions that you have that should be answered up to this point. So, so, so David, so far we've got um, one from Doug who just asked, how do you overcome the power of big agro-business? Uh, just, just a small <laughs> little question. <laughs> Doug, that, that's, a great, that's a great one. First, I think, for the purposes of this afternoon, is to understand agro-business as a system and understand it as a component within the larger food and agricultural system in the United States. And that's not an answer uh, overcoming, uh, whether it's giant utilities or food corporations or Archer Daniel Midlands and so forth, really requires the evolution of a, of a different system. But uh, I think that that is actually happening. The short answer, though, Doug, is I don't honestly know. Uh, the alternative agricultural movement uh, goes back quite a number of years to, uh, uh, in Ohio history, a fellow by the name of Lewis Bromfield and Paul Sears, uh, who taught here at Oberlin and also later at Yale, but wrote a book called Deserts on the March Movement. And I think the best way to move is to eat our way into a new future, eat local and understand that the eating itself, the act of eating is itself, uh, as Wendell Berry once put it, a political act. But uh, that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. I will move on um, to uh, the next example. And you could make any number of examples around pollution and uh, the misuse of resources. This one is also embedded in an article that was, uh, should have been sent to each of you. And it begins with the North Pacific gyre. And what you see in the screen is the ocean currents with a large gray mass in the middle. Uh, so it's a gyre that changes shape and form. It's roughly uh, thought to be either the size of the state of Texas or the size of the lower 48 states of the United States. No one knows for sure. It's not highly evident from space because space satellites are still looking down on water, but it's thought to be perhaps as much as 1,000 feet deep. And we know that the 
most of the items in that North Pacific gyre and other similar gyres all around the world are plastics and things that made made by humans that were uh, used and discarded, floated down rivers out into the ocean or were dumped out of ships. And those gyres accumulate, uh, are accumulating fast enough that by one estimate released uh, uh, about a month ago, or two months ago maybe, will be larger in weight than all of the marine life in the ocean, sometime around, they thought, by 2050. So the weight of all our junk and debris thrown into uh, the oceans will outweigh all the fish and marine life uh, by 2050, uh, more or less. But uh, it is a, uh, a mess. What I'm asking for you to do is to think through the system that caused this. And the system that caused this uh, gyre of trash that looks something like this, and you find lots of pictures on, on line with this, and then floating up on shores, each of those items had a history. And if you track that history back, you find a kid in a classroom in high school and college and university learning how to make plastics and various kinds of substances, many of which uh, nature has no evolutionary experience with. You find other kids in classes uh, learning how to market whatever companies make, and other kids in other classes in law and politics learning how to defend the making and this easy discarding of those things. And so if you put this system together, you find it tracing back into my field in education where young people are learning how to make things but not how to uh, defend or protect the health of the biosphere or some reason why they shouldn't make them. And that's the article I sent you that's uh, in the book that comes out this, this summer. But in these two cases, whether uh, it's a dead zone off the mouth of the Mississippi or rates of obesity in American society or trash floating in the Pacific in massive volumes, with all kinds of ecological effects and breakdown products and so forth. These are long life problems of virtually everything uh, like this is, whether it's the climate change crisis or pollution or whatever. Um, in a systems perspective, these aren't accidents. They're simply the normal working out of the system, which is to say that they're symptoms of some larger problem. They're self-amplifying, they tend to increase on their own. There's no negative feedback uh, on uh, the use of chemicals unless we place it there and stop the flow of nitrogen down the Mississippi or unless we begin to create uh, what is now being called the circular economy, that if you make it, you own it and uh, throw away less. Uh, there's no legal liability. Uh, there's no one that's going to be particularly penalized for creating a dead zone off the mouth of the Mississippi or a trash gyre the size of the lower 48 states in the United States or for creating a gyre of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere over our head that will change climate. Uh, no one in particular has been responsible. And then these are, I think, traceable in most ways back to my field again of education. Uh, because information was given and incredible power was given without a particular context for it. Um, let me go to a third uh, issue area, and then I want to stop again and ask for any, any questions. But this is energy policy, which has a great deal to do, of course, with uh, climate change and many other things. In this case, there are laws of both ecology and, and thermodynamics, and I put the uh, slide portraying the first and second laws of thermodynamics on the screen, the first of which is that energy and matter uh, is non-destructive. You can't destroy it. So you can change the form of it. You can burn a lump of coal and you get heat, smoke, ashes, work, and various things made from it, but you can't destroy it. It has different forms. Uh, and then the second law is that the, the flow of what is called entropy goes in only one direction. It goes from ordered matter, the lump of coal, to disordered matter, uh, or high, what's called high entropy. And so in this case of energy, there are constraints that have to do with the way systems actually work. 
This is a diagram that was uh, done by the great uh, Amory Lovins, who is perhaps the best person I know on, on all energy issues. But what he's done here is to take the laws of thermodynamics and portray it from the mine mouth uh, where, let's say, coal is mined to a machine and then reason back so that if you require one unit of energy at, to run a machine, how many units of energy must you generate out of the mine at what cost, and how do you convert that into usable forms of energy? So he's tracked the, the traces of the energy flow from the mine to the actual machine that is using energy. And from this, a couple of things uh, are evident. The, uh, the next graphic that should come up is one of the most famous energy graphics ever done. And this was uh, done by McKinsey Global. This is one that appeared in 2007. But what they've done in this, the straight line across the screen in what is otherwise a kind of a confusing graphic, the straight line across the screen is a break-even point. The vertical, that's the horizontal axis, the vertical axis runs from uh, negative cost to uh, uh, free cost, and so, or, or to cost, positive cost. So the items on the very left are done as various kinds of technologies. And as they go up to the break-even point, the rate of return or the cost uh, change. And then you cross the rate of return, and what then on the right-hand side of the blue, all those technologies and so forth become positive. Roughly, what they showed in this was, was in a very different way what Amory was showing in the previous slide, and that is the area below the break-even line, the horizontal axis, is roughly equal to the area above it. And long story short, to cut through a lot of the confusion here, what this means in McKinsey Global's assumption was that energy efficiency, not using energy in the first place, in other words, is the cheapest and easiest and fastest way to uh, a more prosperous economy and the lower the environmental impacts of uh, energy consumption. And so this goes up to about four cents a kilowatt hour uh, in terms of cost. But the take-home message for policymakers was we could eliminate about 40% of our energy consumption by the year 2030 or 2040 at no net cost. This graphic was done in year 2007. If you did it again uh, in 2016 data, uh, the area to the left below the break-even point would be much larger. And for comparison, think of a 100-watt light bulb uh, being replaced by a 17-watt compact fluorescent and then being replaced by a 4-watt LED. So you go from 100 watts to a 4-watt light bulb uh, that lasts longer, has lower maintenance costs, and so forth. So the point of this particular system is that physics does matter. And not using energy is, in fact, the largest source of new energy in the, the economy, as has been pointed out. In changing the system, what, uh, what this slide shows is a system being altered from the typical utility grid pattern we have now to something that is being called variously a smart grid or renewable energy at the local scale and so forth. But it's beginning to rethink uh, the way we use energy in a systems context. And so this is the distributed energy uh, on this particular screen. I don't want, I won't dwell on it because this is familiar, I think, to most everybody now. But it's a different way that is highly decentralized. So instead of the spoke and uh, uh, wheel model, this becomes, looks a lot more like a, a network. Locally, this is what it looks like in, in our town. We put out a, we built a 2.27 megawatt solar array on 11 acres three years ago. Uh, the cost, by the way, of this would have been half uh, of what it cost us three and a half years ago if we had done it last summer. But you see more and more of this around the United States. This, at one point, was the largest array in the, in the state of Ohio. It's now in the kind of a whole hum range. This is what it looks like over a parking lot, uh, but this is all distributed energy. It means you have lots of different energy producers. We're developing a 
uh, an Oblin Solar Co-op that will add another, hopefully, perhaps up to two megawatts of power to our overall power usage by comparison where phase flow here is about 11 megawatts. This, by the way, is Sherrod Brown in the U.S. Senate who's um, a really good guy. In looking at uh, energy policy then as a system, not just simply the sale of electrons, it changes uh, virtually everything. This is one graphic done partly by uh, Rockefeller Foundation and the Deutsche Bank uh, that showed that with an investment of around 270 some billion dollars, you could save 1.1 trillion and generate 3.3 million jobs. In terms of systems thinking, what the analyst in this uh, study did was to look at a system that wasn't just one way flow of energy. How do we keep it growing economy supplied with energy, but how do we do it at the least cost, uh, create jobs, lower environmental impacts, and lower carbon emissions? And it turns out uh, that their analysis was pretty much dead on, if not uh, a bit conservative. This is a graph that uh, all of you would be familiar with that uh, simply summarizes the benefits of systems thinking in this case, applied to the use of, of energy and energy policy. And the sad thing is there's nothing new. When I worked for Jimmy Carter in 1976 uh, as a minor part of his energy team, everything on that slide was known. And yet uh, we are embedded in a much larger political system that uh, raises other kinds of issues. And that goes back to Doug's question of how do you, how do you change the system. Uh, I'm going to do two more slides and then stop for questions. This is the Adam Joseph Lewis Center that uh, Judy mentioned at the beginning. Uh, this building was done in large measure with a lot of student help. We put together a group of architects and engineers that included people like Bill McDonough and Amory Lovins and Carol Franklin and lots of amazing people. <laughs> the, uh, uh, we opened the door to students, so we wanted to have, in this case, understands the, the way systems occur relative to the built environment. And so you could make a systems diagram about the way this building came together, the way it was built, the way it was operated. But this became, in effect, a laboratory on our campus for thinking about how systems in real life come into being. And uh, this is a 14,200 square foot building. It's not a large structure, but it was named uh, two months ago as uh, by uh, Building Design and Construction Magazine is one of 52 game changers of the past 170 years. Uh, I don't know why they didn't go back to the Parthenon, but they chose not to. That's a, a joke, and I can't hear you laughing, but I intended it as a joke. But the point here was to create models that people could see, touch, feel, experience of a different way to think about the built environment. But you could have models of uh, farming and agriculture and so forth. This is a passive solar house at the, a colleague and friend Carl and Mary McDaniel. Uh, this is an entirely solar powered house uh, built more or less in the German passive house standard. This one is, um, the next one here is a house we did at an affordable price that met roughly the same uh, performance targets. And this was sold to a, a single woman below the poverty line with two children. She will never have an energy bill, brand new house. This is a model now for a larger initiative that we're uh, aiming to uh, uh, bring out here in, in Oberlin. This uh, slide, and I'll stop with this and take some questions before I wrap up. This is a, uh, the culmination of work here in Oberlin. This is a hotel and conference center that will be the first, as far as I know, the first entirely solar powered Hotel Conference Center in the United States. This is another one I don't I don't know of it, but this is a building under construction. It will open uh, very soon within the next few weeks. The hotel part is on the right hand side. The conference facility and commercial uh, facilities are either on the left or down on the first uh, level of the structure. This is a U.S. Green Building Council or will be a U.S. Green Building Council uh, platinum. Uh, rated facility, but it will be 100% solar power, and that is in a uh, part of the world where sunshine is still a bit of a theory. But we are uh, sunnier than uh, any part of Germany that is the most solarized nation in the, uh, in the world. Let me stop here.
and take any other questions that have, have come in. Kristen, do you want to ask one of them? Sure. So we have a question from Abby. She asked, how might system theory or tools help us to scale EE across the U.S. and the world? What would that look like in practical terms? Uh, that's a great question. And I think there, there are any number of answers, and I certainly can't be definitive on this. What we did with the Lewis Center and what we've done in the hotel that is on the screen is to engage students in the making of uh, the remaking of the uh, physical uh, town and college. And systems theory was very much part of what we were thinking about. A building, but let me go one more slide here to show the, the, the building, the, the hotel that you see or you saw in the previous picture is part of a 13 acre block in which we're aiming to do systems analysis and uh, systems level technology integration. In this, uh, in this block. So one way to integrate systems is to think of schools as systems. Uh, U.S. Green Building Council and the Green Schools Movement are, I think, trying to do this. Buildings powered by sunshine that release uh, the process their own wastewater and provide some of their own food in the cafeteria locally, that is a building seen as a system. Uh, systems concepts and all people who uh, or involved with elementary education know that uh, uh, you can teach systems uh, as simply as teaching young people how to garden uh, or as uh, detailed and uh, in, in a complex way by the study of, say, soil chemistry and microbiology. So and, and systems concepts need to be fed through the whole system. Excuse me, go ahead. Oh, and David, I was just going to say, Aslan had said, could the change in education be an example of a change in a system, such as teaching recycling at a young age? And I think you're just answering that now. Yep. I think so. So that the, the, the advantage of schools as places where systems is taught, and there's no environmental education without, without engaging in systems. Uh, ecology is a system that we have to understand and in the integration of ecology with other larger systems called politics and sociology and economics and so forth. But to embed the rudiments early in the mind of a, a young person is, is really critically important. But the school for me is the easiest place to begin. They have young people see and participate in the making of the school as a system. Their inputs, their outputs, their feedback mechanisms. So they have these concepts built into the way the school works. Uh, one other comment, and I'll move on. We've taken, in the Lewis Center, we began a, uh, to take feedback on the actual operation of the building and present that in building dashboards. We had the students work in a computer class on developing dashboard technology. They later formed a private company called Lucid Design. But we've taken dashboards and we put them in all the schools here in the city. Uh, my colleagues are getting ready to do 42 dashboards in Cleveland City Schools so that students see the actual effects uh, on a screen of uh, energy use, water use, material use, and whatever else uh, people in the schools want to monitor. But uh, we've done that in public buildings here, the public library, and so this isn't something that can only happen in a school. It can happen uh, in any place uh, uh, in a downtown area. Uh, let me move on. Uh, and David, and this is, oh, David, just one quick thing. We're, we've got a lot of other questions, so we'll save those for the end. A lot of interesting comments coming in, so keep going. Okay. The section, and there's one more, and then I'm, I'm finished, but uh, as a way of seeing, understanding how systems work. And on the screen here, you see solving for pattern, which is a phrase that came from Wendell Berry. So systems is a beginning, a beginning to see the world as a set of solvable problems. If what ails us are badly designed systems, what can fix um, that or better designed systems and design solutions? This was Danella Meadows' response, and I'll only, I don't want to go through this, but simply to refer uh, her thinking on this, if you Google Meadows, uh, places to intervene in the system, the article from which this slide uh, is taken comes up. And what she's asking here is how do we intervene in systems most effectively? 
And just one other thing on this slide, the things at the very top are things that we typically argue about most. The things at the bottom, in inverse order, the most effective things are to change consciousness. Uh, those are things that are harder to do, but if you want to change the system, eventually you have to change consciousness of the people in the system. Uh, system thinking ought to be built into uh, education from uh, kindergarten on, on up. And it has a variety of different forms, but I called that in the early book, Ecological Literacy. But that's what you all do as uh, professionals and educators. And uh, systems is also a different way to see the world. Uh, the, if I was to ask why the bombs went off in uh, the airport in Brussels today, that is one of the fast variables. That's a news headline. It'll be dwelled on and so forth. If I was to ask what were the slow factors that led to that, that's the systems level question. And so I've, I've put here uh, things that change rather slowly, but there's systemic factors that eventually produce headlines. Uh, this is simply a way to say that the aim of uh, environmental education for me is summarized here. Helping students understand the pattern that connects, this phrase that comes from Gregory Basin, understanding how systems work, whether it's a banking system, economic system, or simply the school system or local governance or whatever. And then extending time horizons out in the future. Most systems have uh, behavioral uh, characteristics that last in the case of the opening comments of Jim Hansen on climate change, they last for centuries or millennia. Uh, we need to extend our uh, thinking pattern to accommodate that. Um, a couple of final thoughts here. We pay for sustainability, or if I said this differently, we pay for uh, the thinking systems whether we get it or not. And the failure to think in systems uh, is, is comes out of a whole series of other problems, and you can see these in white on the screen, and you can make a much longer list there. One of the goals of thinking about systems is to optimize the system, not the parts. In the case of buildings, that is very uh, easily portrayable, uh, to optimize the way the whole system works, not to try to optimize, for example, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system, but to optimize the entire building, which includes uh, the R factor and the shell of the building, the insulation value of the walls, or the windows, and the, the ceiling, and so forth. And then uh, I mentioned earlier that um, there are no real axioms. You want to understand the way the world works. System theory offers a way, not the, not the way, but a way to see how things occur in, in the world. And then I want to finish up with uh, uh, a couple of thoughts here. Uh, this is simply one, one way to say all of this. We live in one world. Things are connected. What goes around comes around. Uh, the words whole health, holy, are indivisible. And uh, so you can you can go off and you can take the systems theory and systems thinking and go into spirituality very easily. Einstein put it uh, this way, a human being is part of a whole called the FC universe. And his concluding comment here, I think, bears a great deal of resemblance to Pope Francis' recent encyclical, the Dr. C, in which he referred to integral ecology, uh, which I think Einstein would have agreed with uh, the terminology, but he referred to integral ecology at least uh, two dozen times in that manuscript. Now, finally, I'm going to put out some reading. Uh, Pritchard Capra, uh, in Pierre Luisi's book, The Systems of Life, is a wonderful overview of the whole thing. Danella Meadows is uh, the book I quoted from at the very beginning. Brilliant. It's fairly short. It's the last thing. It was actually published posthumously after her death. Um, but there's a long literature here. This slide has Walter Cannon's uh, very famous book, The Wisdom of the Body. He was one of the founders of cybernetics. Walter, or Brian Ludwig, von Berlanti's book, General Systems Theory, is one of the classic books. Um, and then four other books. Uh, the best on global change is uh, the one on the left-hand side here. Uh, Danella Meadows is one of the authors of The Limits to Growth. This is uh, The Limits to Growth, the 30-year update. Jorgen Randers was also one of the authors of the original Limits to Growth book. And these are, uh, uh, that's a recent book that he wrote that came out two years ago. And finally, Peter Senge's book, uh, The Fifth Discipline. Peter Senge was 
the system scientist at uh, MIT ran the uh, systems program there. And this book is directed primarily at organizations. But this is a small sampling of a very large literature. With that, let me stop and uh, let's go to questions. David, thank you so much. And we've had a lot of, a, a number of great questions and comments and resources posted that we will send back out to you. Kristen, do you want to read a couple of questions? In the time sure. We have? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have a question from Sarah. She asked, I primarily teach undergraduate students, but others may educate other ages. What are the best methods to teach or inspire our students? How would you suggest we get them excited about systems? So you know, uh, the uh, it's a great question, and and we have some kids that learn by doing, some kids that learn by reading, and uh, some that do by both. For for me, and this is a very personal answer, developing the Lewis Center and the hotel, and what we're now calling the Oberlin Project, is the best way I can uh, I can in my circumstances teach systems thinking. Uh, it's learning by doing. Uh, involves architecture, engineering, finance, business, public policy, cash flow issues, but engaging kids in the act of changing their communities and beginning to respond to the climate crisis in ways that we're equipping it with the wherewithal to, to do differently. Uh, kids in elementary schools, I'm on the board or have been on the board for years of the Center for Eco Literacy in Berkeley. They teach systems thinking by getting kids very early engaged in gardening and in their food system. And it's a brilliant way to, to do it. I, I don't think there's a formula. Eventually you want kids to understand the core concepts, though, that I had in your earlier slides of feedback and emerging properties and, and so forth. But to actually get them doing things where they have to begin to think systemically uh, uh, to make something happen. Um. David, Rob asked, how can we take models like the Oberlin Project and replicate them in other communities? Um, we've got a, Rob, send me an email. My email address is, uh, I think there's some place, just david.org, oberlin.edu. And I'll send you some material on the Oberlin Project. We conceived it as being a college, community, city joint endeavor. Uh, it was conceived originally uh, seven years ago as being temporary, but catalytic, starting things that otherwise weren't going to happen, and cross-sectoral. And so we focused on education, food, public policy, the economy, creating jobs. Uh, we're busy uh, starting a couple of different uh, commercial enterprises. We're starting a food hub this summer uh, as a linchpin between the farm community and the local food system here. but. I'd be happy to elaborate that on that uh, with you offline and send you information uh, about it. And uh, David, we'll just take a couple really quickly and then end here. We've got a lot of good ideas. Um, uh, Rob, I think, asked, or no, it's Aslan asked, um, do you think the impact of, uh, what do you think about the impact of hydroponic farming? Should it be the farming of the future? Any thoughts? I think it, it, it certainly has a place to play in farming, and farming is going to become more difficult with climate change and extremes of weather and temperature and rainfall and so forth. So uh, hydroponics is a little bit more controllable. It certainly has a place. There are hydroponic farmers close by to Oberlin that have been farming uh, traditionally for uh, a century, and their families are shifting into different kinds of uh, agriculture. So sure, it, it, it's got a place. And that a hydroponic farm is also a very good model for students uh, to see systems concepts. You have the flow of nutrients and energy and water and, and so forth. And so it also is a great example of the way systems work and sometimes don't work. And one last question um, from Danica or Danica. Um, I was struck by the idea that changing one worldview consciousness was one of the most effective places to intervene in a system. Do you know any people, organizations that are doing this well and how? I know that's a big one, too. So that will be our last question. <laughs> um, well, the uh, I'm hesitating. I want to find a quote. I may not be able to find this uh, in time, but the Nella Meadows comment in thinking in systems about uh, changing mindset is it is the most hazardous place to work. And she says this line, and I'm 
paraphrase because I can't find the quote, but we tend to kill people who uh, try to change how we think. And you don't have to have uh, any imagination to, to remember a long list of martyrs who tried to change uh, the way we saw the world, our place in it, which is to say the systems. And Martin Luther King immediately leaps to mind that uh, there are many others. But uh, changing ideas is the work of education. We should be making people who are uh, dangerous to the existing system because the existing system powered by fossil fuels and economic growth is hazardous to the human future. But we should be turning out students who are uh, joyfully dangerous to that system and giving them the tools to quietly or noisily, whatever their choice is, change the system, uh, the larger system. And I think uh, the book I've, I've got coming out this summer, I'm arguing that the changes really begin at the bottom. They do begin in small towns and schools and very kind of out-of-the-way places. But uh, And those changes are happening all over the world. So what I described uh, this afternoon is uh, becoming commonplace everywhere. You can't go anywhere in the world without finding people reckoning now with systems, whether they call it by that name or not, but dealing with complicated patterns. And the difference is seeing the world as networks and the world as engagement. And causality is complex, not linear, not single-shot kind of causality. Uh, you see it in the uh, the interest in uh, alternative medicine from acupuncture and so forth, seeing the body, as Walter Cannon described it uh, in 1932, uh, as having its own kind of wisdom. And instead of the uh, the shotgun or bullet approach to uh, health care, you have an ailment, you take a pill. The Chinese knew, knew long ago that uh, you don't deal with issues of health, you deal with issues of uh, Sorry, issues of illness, you deal with issues of health, the whole system. But it's a very, it's a different way to see the world. And yeah. seeing the world differently is always going to be inconvenient and a bit dangerous to people whose livelihood or uh, whose uh, uh, companies and so forth require them to see it uh, otherwise. Well, David. This has been amazing. I wish we had you for a lot longer. Um, we've got a lot of great questions here um, that we'll share with you later. And uh, Gareth just um, posted, cultivating students that are dangerous to the existing system. I love it. So thank you so much for always making us think um, and for presenting that. And we will be, here's David's um, email, by the way, david.or at oberlin.edu. Just remember, he's a busy guy, and we will post the webinar, and so you'll get a chance to see, uh, hear it again, see the resources that are there. We'll send that out to you. And just thank you all for joining this one. We do have some other great speakers coming up. But, David, thanks for being part of this one. You've been amazing, as always. Um, April 26th is Andy Goodman. And for those of you who are not familiar with EE Pro, you can find out more about the webinar series and hear the recordings, do a search, and find what David just said because he was moving quickly to be able to take a, uh, a little bit more thoughtful look at some of the things that he was talking about. And feel free to join any of the interest groups or discussion groups on EE Pro to stay engaged, to post things, to read blogs, to see what other people are thinking. And you just log in using your NAA um, credentials. I also want to thank Kristen Kunkel, who's the brains behind the webinar series and helping every step of the way organize everything and make sure that these come off. As we all know, technology can be tough sometimes, but it's also wonderful. So, David, thank you, thank you. Let's give him a virtual round of applause, and thanks to everybody on the call. We'll see you next month, and thank you, David, for everything. Thank you, and, uh, and thanks to all of you for being on the uh on the webinar this afternoon. It was nice to share a bit of time with you. Thanks, everyone. Take care.